I conducted some research last year, and in that research, we stumbled across what, I across what I think is a really fascinating question. The question that we asked in our research was this. If the culture of your workplace was to become as good as it realistically could, how much improvement would there be on people's performance slash productivity? Now, whenever I get the chance, I'll, in, when I'm in front of a leadership team, I will ask this question. And when I do it in person now, I will stress this point. I will say zero is a legitimate response. You might think that your culture realistically is as good as it's going to get. So zero is a legitimate response. I would like you to ponder the question in that context. If the culture of your workplace was to become as good as it realistically could, how much improvement would there be on people's performance slash productivity? Put a percentage on it, tell the people you're sitting nearby, and in 15 seconds I'm going to see if any of you are prepared to share that. Your time starts now. Over to you. Okay, stop there, please. Thank you very much. Thanks, folks. Thank you, folks. Stop there, please. Stop there, please. Okay, of course, you do not have to say what number you just shared just now. Of course, you don't have to, but I'd really like it if some of you could uh, reveal either the number you shared or a number you heard just now. So, you get my tactic in saying that. Um, you heard 80. Wow. Anyone else, please? 50. This is a reverse auction, you see. Anyone else? 30? 40? 30? 50? <laughs> and the winner is... Um, these are big numbers, would you agree? And I'm presuming you were serious. Um, the numbers you just shared are not, un are not unusual. In fact, in the research, I'm going to share with you what results we got. I'm going to share with you now the percentage of people who said 20% or more, the percentage of people who said 50% or more, and so on. So this is the results we got from the research. 91% of people said 20% or more. 40% of people said 50% or more. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Actually, I'm misleading you because those results you can see there are from non-managers, uh, from senior managers, I'm sorry from senior managers. So in a moment, I'm going to reveal the, percent, the responses we got from middle managers. Do you think they saw more or less capacity for improvement? Give me a word. Um, those of you who said more, you're dead right. 58% of middle managers are saying 50% or more. These are big numbers. Non-managers, more or less. Uh, there is one little blip I can't explain, that 56 there, but look at this. One quarter of non-managers saying 80% or more. Let's make the presumption that all these people are wildly over-optimistic. Would you still take it? <laughs> Do you get my point? When I'm working with an organisation and we explore this notion, I say get excited, folks, because the capacity for improvement is resting at our feet. It is the culture of our workplace. Now, there's a lot of talk about culture. And I think in many cases it is simply that, talk. Why is it that culture so often is on the increase in terms of the extent to which it's talked about, but, so, but there remains this capacity for improvement? Well, I think there's a number of factors that contribute to culture not seriously being addressed. And I think one of the major contributors relates to the complexity of the concept. The notion of culture is very complex. It's for that reason I've created a new concept which I think goes all the way to helping people understand culture in simple and practical terms. My concept is called UGRs, which stands for Unwritten Ground Rules. Unwritten Ground Rules. If you take anything from today, this ought to be number one on the list. The best way to think about UGRs, or Unwritten Ground Rules, is that they are people's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. People's perceptions of this is the way we do things around here. So I put to you, it is your Unwritten Ground Rules, or UGRs, that constitute your culture. I put to you, they are one and the same thing. So by way of example, I'm going to share with you some actual UGRs that I've come across in the workplace. What I'm about to share with you are real. They are actual UGRs, and they are these. At our meetings, it isn't worth complaining because nothing will get done. The only time anyone gets spoken to by the boss is when something is wrong. 
The organisation talks about the importance of service, but we know they don't really mean it, so we don't really have to worry about it. I can interject here and say that when I'm sharing these with people from the same organisation, it's not uncommon at about this point for people to say, have you been watching us? <laughs> our funniest jokes usually involve making jokes about our work colleagues. When I first wrote this one, it read a little more brutally, and it read our funniest jokes usually involve dumping on our workmates. We go through the motions with our bosses. Once they're gone, we do what we want. And I can read the minds of a few of you who are right now thinking, so what's wrong with that one? But that's not there, you know, there. Now, in an organisation that has documented policies, procedures, standards of service, pres very prescriptive job descriptions, all the procedures written up, which counts most, the documentation or the UGRs? It's a silly question. You all know that the UGRs count most. And you know the incredible thing about UGRs? They are seldom talked about openly. People have to deduce them. A good test for UGRs in any team or organisation is the new employee. If the new employee is lucky, they get an induction or orientation where they get told this is the way we do things around here. And then they go and find out the truth. <laughs> and they find out by deduction. They will look for certain cues and clues to deduce the UGRs in their new team or organisation. So, I've been working on a theory. I'd honestly like your feedback. I think this is pretty close to a 100% rule. But please give me your feedback on this. A person who is new to a job, irrespective of their level of seniority, is quieter than what they normally would be, yes or no? Yes. Don't you think that's true? Pretty close to 100%. Why are they quieter? They don't understand. They're assessing. Bingo. Um, I put to you, we don't have the term UGRs in our heads, but I put to you it is the natural human instinct that we stay quieter to check out what the UGRs are. By the way, this is not confined to work contexts. It applies to human beings. So any gathering of people, this is the case. If it's in a church or a sporting club or whatever, there are UGRs and people will, new people will stay quieter to check out what the UGRs are. Why? They want to fit in. So let me paraphrase what you've just said because I agree with you 100%. They, well, we stay quieter to check out what the UGRs are in order that we can conform. It's remarkable. So, here's a hypothetical. Um, somebody who highly respects your opinion has come to you with a specific question. The question is this. I'm starting at your organisation next week. This is what this person is saying. What should I... But it's in a different work, in different division, not in your work area. And their question is this. What should I look for or look at when I start my job next week to deduce what the UGRs are? Now, I'm going to get you to chat about this for 45 seconds at your table, but before you do, a word of warning. If you're thinking that your advice might be, well, look at people's attitudes, that's not good enough, because what am I looking at? I want you to be specific in thinking through what it is that that person ought to look for or look at to deduce the UGRs in their new, in, the, in your organisation, but another uh, part of the business um, which is different from yours. Does my question make sense? You've got 45 seconds, your time starts now. Go. Okay, thank you, folks. Thank you, folks. Get you to stop there if I can. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Um, I'm really keen to hear your thoughts. Uh, I'm not going to have a micro roving microphone because your response is going to be short. But if you could share um, one thing, uh, if you could share that in a loud voice, that'd be brilliant. Somebody, please. What, what, would this, what should this person look for or look at? Anyone help me here? 
uh, the hours people work. So do people arrive at the death knock? If it's a 9 o'clock start, are they arriving at the death knock? Are they looking at the second hand of their watch ready to sprint once it's finished time? Um, does a 10 o'clock meeting start at 10 o'clock or do people saunter in at quarter past 10? This works in both directions. If it's a 5 o'clock finish and everyone else still, is still there at 6.30, is the first person to leave at 20 to 7 frowned upon? <laughs> If you arrive at a 10 o'clock meeting at 10 o'clock, does that demonstrate to other people that you're not busy enough? <laughs> you with me on that one? Um, brilliant. What else, please? What's a piece of advice you give this person? Um, terrific. That's where you might find out what the UGRs are. Although, um, I know of a UGR which says, around here, new people to our group are to be treated with a deeper suspicion until they prove their worth if you're with me on that one. Uh, listen to the conversations. Now, that's really clever, isn't it? And Maybe that's what you're referring to. Um, listen to the conversations. Are they talking about the organisation? Is it mostly positive or is it mostly negative? Are they talking about bosses? Is it mostly positive? Is it mostly negative? Do conversations change when a boss walks in the room? What do they say about a boss when they're there? What do they say when a boss walks away? For that matter, what do they say about anyone when they're there? What do they say about anyone when they walk away? Um, I want to look at things like um, how customers are treated, what is said about a customer after the phone has been put down. Um, I'd want to look at um, how people are treated, what happens when things go wrong. Are people ducking for cover or do people look at it as a learning opportunity and more than happily happy to accept responsibility? Uh, I think meetings are great tests, great litmus tests for the UGR. So I want to see uh, if meetings happen. I want to see if meetings do happen, whether uh, leaders uh, commonly find reason not to attend the meeting. I want to see if a meeting is one-way information dissemination or whether people actively contribute at a meeting. At a meeting, I'd like to see if a different point of view is ever raised. If it is, how is it greeted? I'd like to see at a meeting what is said immediately after the meeting. I don't know if any of you have been to a meeting. Wait a minute, we've got an action shot with a photograph here. Is that good? That's my first joke for the afternoon, guys. Come on, you could work with me here. Is it the quality of my jokes or is it you? It's the quality of my jokes. Thanks for the feedback. Um, I don't know if any of you have been on many like I have, but the person who's running it, they'll say something like, like this. They'll say, folks, I know this has been a tough decision, but I do appreciate your contribution. It's about time for us to finish up here. Are there any other questions or concerns that people have before we do finish up? No? Okay, thanks, folks. See you next week. People stand up, walk out into the corridor. That's when it starts. At a meeting, I'd particularly like to see where people's eyes are. I'm going to share with you a true story. This literally happened to me. I was invited to present to the top 20 people of a large organisation, uh, an Australian organisation. In fact, this was in Perth. This group of uh, 20 people included the CEO. I'm invited in to do a one-hour presentation on the topic of UGRs. 15 minutes into my present... Well, let me, pic let, let me try and paint a picture for you. Um, I walk into the boardroom where they're already at, and it's a big, long board table. At the top of the board table is the CEO. Everyone else is down the sides, and I'm down the bottom. That's fine. That's as I expected. Fifteen minutes into my presentation, I am gone, finished, shattered. I literally could not continue after 15 minutes. Remember, I'm invited in to speak on the topic of UGRs for one hour. Picture this in your mind's eye if you possibly can. For the entire first 15 minutes of my presentation, the entire first 15 minutes, Every single person's eyes in that room were fixed firmly on the table in front of them. Can you picture this? A bit more feedback would have been useful here because I still need therapy on this one. <laughs> so maybe I'll ask again, can you picture this? Seriously. Yes. If that were you, can you imagine this impact? Serious question. If that were you, can you imagine this impact on you? Can you? Yes. I reckon I did well the last 15 minutes. Because I can guarantee, in fact, you should set this up at work. No, don't do it. It's too nasty. Don't do it. I'm gone after 15 minutes. Your confidence is shattered. We've all seen beginning speakers and trainers. They shake, right? I regressed to that because your confidence is shot. So my, I am shaking and the shaking is now starting to come out my voice. I literally could not continue. So I stopped. I said, look, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to stop here. I then had to find something I could lean on and I needed, I needed some support. <laughs> and I said this. I said, look, um, to be honest, I'm picking up a UGR in this room right now. I admit I may be incorrect in interpreting it, but I'm seeing everyone's eyes fixed firmly on the table in front of them. I'm picking up a UGR, which is around here. Outsiders have got nothing to contribute. Well, a few eyes lifted then. 
I committed suicide, however, didn't get any work with that organisation. <laughs> and a good mate of mine who I told this story to, he's a good thinker, he said, Steve, do you think you might have jumped in too early in saying that? Well, I've thought long and hard about that. Do you know what? If the same thing happened to me again tomorrow, I'd do exactly the same thing. In fact, I'd probably jump in a bit earlier. Why? Because there's a huge area in this group that says something like this. Around here, our internal politics are more important than showing respect to an outsider. Are you with me on this one? Somebody else said, Steve, maybe it's the new board table they're all admiring. I don't think so. <laughs> now, I'm going to make a big call and I'm choosing these words carefully. The incredible thing about UGRs is that they are seldom talked about openly. Here's my big call and I'm seriously choosing these words carefully. I think there is nothing more powerful in a team or an organisation than its UGRs. Nothing. And yet, incredibly, they are seldom talked about openly. If you doubt the power of UGRs, I'd like to share with you a story that's purported to be true. It's a story about behavioural scientists who place five monkeys into a cage. This is a regular cage, except for the fact it has a ladder in it. At the top of the ladder is a bunch of bananas, and the ceiling of this cage has sprinklers in it through which water can flow. There's a button outside that can turn the sprinklers on. The scientists place the monkeys into the cage. It doesn't take them long to spot the bananas. They begin to hit the ladder, which time the scientists press the button, the sprinklers get turned on, the monkeys get drenched. Try it up again, they get drenched again. Again, they get drenched again. This continues and continues until... What do you think happens after a time? No, they don't drown. They're very humane. No, um, they st actually stop trying to go up. What happens next is really quite intriguing. The scientists remove one of the original monkeys in its place, put a new one. Something extraordinary happens. The new monkey spots the bananas, begins to set up the ladder. Incredibly, the scientists need not to need the button because as the new monkey heads up, the others aggressively jump on him and pull him down. He tries to go again, they jump on him, pull him down. Again, they jump on him, pull him down. That continues and continues until that new monkey tries no more. They then take another of the original monkeys out in this place with another new one. You can guess what happens. He tries to go up. The others aggressively jump on him and pull him down. Again, that continues until he tries no more. After a time, each of the original monkeys has been replaced. And then put another new monkey in the cage. He spots the bananas, begins to head up the ladder. The others aggressively jump on him and pull him down. Why? Not one of them knows. This is why we do things around here. And you all know that if you've ever tried to fight against the current, the prevailing UGRs in the team or the organisation, you're quickly getting pulled back by others. Am I right here? Yes or no? Um, okay. So, I think one of the reasons that culture is not attended to is because it's so complex. I put to you, it is not complex. It is the UGRs. And your team will have a mix of positive UGRs, negative UGRs, and some in between. Uh, the question is, are we aware of those? And to what extent are we happy to carry the less than positive UGRs? This is, this is key to, I think, any culture, uh, customer experience um, initiative. So, oh, there's my monkeys. A bit disappointed with the lack of response to those. I'll try it again, because I've put a lot of effort into that slide. Um, there's my monkeys. Clearly fake. There was another joke there, guys, but anyway, we'll move on. Um, so, I put to you that we can use a five-step process, and today I've got time to share with you a couple of the, those five steps to use UGRs both as a tool to understand and improve the prevailing culture in a way that's going to um, enable your cult cu customer experience initiatives to truly realise their potential. Step number one is what we call Envision, and I've got a really good question um, for you right now, which is the envision step. We've got to picture what kind of culture we need. So my question is this, and I wonder about the extent to which this question or a version of it is asked within any organisation when a customer experience initiative is being pondered or implemented. The question is this, what are the key cultural attributes we need in place for our customer experience initiative to be truly successful? Put more simply, for our customer experience initiative to be successful, what does our culture need to look and feel like? I would like you to ponder that question now at your table, and I'd like you to think of some words in terms of how you would respond to that question, because I'm going to show you how this links back to UGRs in one moment. You've got 45 seconds, talk about it at your table, and somebody remember some of the words that are being talked about. What does your culture need to look like for your customer experience initiative truly to be successful? Over to you for 45 seconds.
Okay, thank you very much, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like you to remember those words if you can, or the extent to which you can remember those, but I'm going to ask for the moment that we park those to one side. So please, please try and hang on to some of those words that you've just generated in response to that question. The second step of our process of using UGRs to understand and improve the culture is what we call assess. And to describe the assess phase, I'd like to share with you some outcomes from some work that uh, got undertaken quite a while back because soon after I created UGRs, I approached the, um, the then Dean of the Graduate School of Management at the University of Western Australia to run the idea past him. Um, Professor Jeff Souter was his, is his name. And I wanted to run the idea past him to see whether this is a new way of looking at workplace culture. And Jeff said it was, in fact, so much so, he said, we're going to get Curtin University involved. We're going to do world-first research into UGRs, which we did. Um, one of the parts of the research was gobsmacking in what we learned, but awesome in its simplicity. And I wish we could claim this is my idea. It wasn't. It was Professor Jeff Souters. We got people from five different companies to complete the sentence to what we now call lead in sentences. Lead in sentences. And we discovered this was a powerful but simple way to unearth the prevailing UGRs. We said to people, think about the way we do things around here and complete the sentence. So here is one that we did in the research. Around here, customers are. Would any of you like to predict some of the responses we got to that? Valued, yes, we did get that. Mean, we did get that. Annoying, Annoying. you've been reading my notes, we literally got that. Stupid. Stupid, yes, now you're getting onto it. You were really tapping into some of the stuff that we tapped into. One, um, here's some actual responses we got from the research. Customers are, complainers, something, we're slackers. Another wrote this. A necessary pain without them or not have a job, not be able to achieve my goals in life, but they are not very well informed about our business, this makes my job harder. Customs are very demanding, don't know what they really want, don't provide really time frames, respect the world. Apart from that, they're okay. <laughs> I put to you, this is the real culture. I put to you, have whatever words you like on the walls, if this is the UGRs, this is what drives people's behaviour. Another lead in sentence was this. Around here, if you criticise your boss, you'd like to predict some, predict some of the responses we got to that one. <laughs> well, one person wrote, CLM, career limiting move. Uh, one wrote this, you'll be frowned upon and probably not advanced too far in the business. Unfortunately, feedback in the upwards direction is not common practice. Another wrote this, it's always when you're with work workmates that the boss never gets to hear the criticism and continues on his merry way thinking he is doing well. We know that the boss does not like to be criticised anyway. Do you get the power of this? I put to you it is the UGRs that are driving people's behaviour, yet the paradox is that they seldom if ever talked about openly. I put to you we need to envision the kind of culture that is necessary for our, culture, for our customer experience initiative to be successful, and then we can find out what the UGRs are in relation to those cultural attributes. So what are some aspects of the culture that you need in place for your customer experience initiative to be truly successful? Give me a word, please. Anyone? Say it again. Uh, well, give me a sentence. Uh, okay, so around here when a customer complains, complete the sentence. So what I'm doing here is demonstrating how we can craft lead in sentences linked to the cultural attributes that are necessary for our customer experience to be successful. Does this make sense? Um, give me another one, please, somebody else. What's an attribute? Uh, empowered. Um, around here when people are asked to do something, complete the sentence. Or around here when something goes wrong. Uh, some of you might have said um, teamwork and respect around here when it comes to dealing with other work areas or around here when you need help. Is this making sense? We can find out what the current UGRs are in relation to those attributes which are necessary for our customer experience initiative to be successful. Now, those are two steps. There are three others, um, which I'm more than happy to uh, make available to you. If any of you want to grab one of these booklets, uh, there's a few here. Uh, you can email, give me a business card and I'll email one of those to you if you want and it talks through the five steps. Um, Tim, if we could go to the third last slide rather than the last one, please, mate. Because um, I want to show you uh, the gym that I used to go to up until a year ago. We used to live in the Gold Coast. One year ago, we moved to Melbourne. And I'm, I'm about to show you the gym that, we used to, that I used to go to on the Gold Coast. To the right-hand side, you can see... Well, that building is the gym itself. To the right-hand side is a driveway that you drive up. You drive past the front entrance of the gym and then back down into the car park. Does that make sense? The top two bays closest to the doorway have a sign in front of them. Would you like to guess what that sign is? Yeah. Not staff, no. 
but it is this sign. I personally took this photograph. Okay, makes sense. Those two bays there. And the next three bays down from the disabled bays have an interesting sign in front of them. And um, the, that sign says this. I personally took this photograph. Mothers with trans parking only. So I go to the gym on a Saturday morning for a 6.30 class. In front of me is a BMW. The BMW drives in and parks in the Mothers with Prams Bay. Out of the BMW gets a young lady. I later found out her name is Bridget. I found this out for research purposes only. Um, her, <laughs> her name is Bridget. She's a university student. She has no child, so far as I'm aware. She has no intention of having a child. She's parked in the Mothers with Prams Bay. What is she thinking as she parks in there? Let me put this to you. You cannot not see the sign. That's why I took a photograph of it. She didn't back in. She drove in. You can't not see the sign. Tell the people you sit, you're sitting next to, what is she thinking as she parks there? Go. Okay, thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I put to you, in the very brief time I gave you just then, I put to you that some of you may have said she's thinking, oh, they don't deserve it, or I won't get caught, or it's not a fair rule anyway. Is that fair? Uh, okay. Um, as I get older, I get clearer about what I dislike. And here's one, one thing that really gets on my goat. People who park in a disabled bay when they shouldn't. It really gets on my goat. I will not go there. I will not contemplate it. I don't care how many bays are full. I won't go there. For me, parking in a disabled bay is a must not do. For me, parking in a mother's with prans bay is a must not do. I won't go there. That is not the case for Bridget. For her, it is a should not do. I put to you, as soon as something is a should, we can find reasons of the type that I just articulated to find reasons to do it. Let me give you an example. I'm a platinum flyer with Qantas and with Virgin. I know how the systems work. Do we have any Qantas or Virgin people? I should have checked that first. We do? Um, good to have you here. <laughs> um, um, I know they have an internal rule for platinum flyers, which means when you give your boarding pass, they're meant to use your name. It's not hard. It says your name and it says platinum. Both, both airlines have it. I get in a flight of an unnamed airline lately and what, that I, if that guy wasn't there, I would have named it. Um, I get in a flight and I get my boarding pass and the lady says, welcome aboard, sir. It doesn't use my name. Not a problem. I get in, on the plane, I sit down. On the tarmac is a guy with earmuffs on, bright orange vest, safety gear wrapped around his arm. For that airline, is safety a must or a should? For that airline, is customer service a must or a should? You're getting my drift. At some time in the past, in the aviation industry, safety was a should. They've cranked it up and made it a must. Does that make sense? We can do with the same with our culture, guys. Because I put to you, what's your culture now? And is it a should or a must? Because we can get everyone involved to make it a must. I think that's truly exciting. I'm going to close. And I used, to, uh, quote by quoting, I used to close by quoting other people. I used to say, you know, definition of insanity, you're doing the same thing and expecting different results. We've all heard that. Um, you, you know those quotes. So now I don't. Now I quote with me. Now I finish with me. This is my quote. If you do tomorrow what you did yesterday, your future is history. You like that? <laughs> but wait, there's more. If you do tomorrow what we've covered today, your future is historic. Thanks very much, folks.